Hi, and welcome to another edition of Studio 411. I'm your host, Larry De Silva, and uh, it's always a pleasure when we have returning guests joining us, and uh, we've got uh, a, a great uh, guy, a great author, and a terrific book that he has come up with that uh, we're going to be discussing for the hour. Uh, Marty Appel joins us. He's got a new book that you see right here called Casey Stengel, Baseball's Greatest Character. And, of course, Marty goes way back, uh, the youngest public uh, relations director in baseball history when George Steinbrenner elevated him to the uh, New York Yankee Post in 1973. Going back even before that, he was uh, uh, Mickey Mantle's caddy, I guess for lack of a better word, back in the day uh, in the mid-60s, uh, helping the Mick during his final years uh, in baseball with the Yankees. Uh, before we bring on Marty, we've got a little uh, clip, tell you a little bit about the book, some of the people in it, so uh, why don't we take a look. And now I think you know a little bit about our subject matter for today. Uh, let us bring on our guest, uh, author, and uh, as a matter of fact, he told me he just won a, an award recently. So let's welcome back long overdue Marty Appel. Marty, welcome back to Studio 411. Thank you, Larry. Good to be with you. So tell me, uh, uh, just before we started taping now, the, uh, the book is uh, doing very well, uh, and uh, you just received an award, I guess? Yeah, it was really a, a great honor. Um, it's called the Casey Award. Coincidentally, it's really named for Casey at the Bat Poem. But it went to my Casey Stengel book. Uh, the award is given by a literary magazine called Spitball, which is baseball-themed poetry and short stories. And uh, I went to Cincinnati uh, a couple of weeks ago to receive the award. Uh, it was really a great honor. And it was my second time winning. I won 21 years ago for a biography of a 19th century player, Mike King Kelly. So to win 21 years apart, kind of like George Brett's batting titles, I think. I'll and, say, yeah, uh, or, uh, really nice or, honor. or Gaylord Perry. Uh, he, he won a couple of awards with a, a good span in between. So, yeah, something definitely to be proud of. Uh, tell me, obviously, uh, the book needs no introduction. Casey uh, Stengel, uh, certainly iconic individual in sports, and uh, many people that, uh, uh, like myself that are old enough uh, to have caught the tail end of Casey's career. Um, where did the idea is not the right word, but again, wh wh when did you it decide? Actually, when did you decide to put the book together, and kind of what was the motivating factor? Well, a couple of things. First, it does kind of need an introduction because I discovered during my research and during the writing process that very, very few people under forty have ever heard of Casey Stengel. So I was writing to an audience that. Everybody under 40 was not part of that audience. Um, he'd largely been forgotten. But when MLB Network went on the air, they used to do this thing called Prime Nine, the best baseball movies, the best baseball food, things like that. And they named Casey Stengel as baseball's greatest character. So that means he beat out Babe Ruth and Yogi Berra and Dizzy Dean and Satchel Paige. He beat out everybody, 16,000 people. So my publisher, Doubleday, uh, my editor, Jason Kaufman, called me and said, I think it's time for a new Casey Stengel book. Now, there had been one in the 80s by my friend, the late Bob Creamer, and that was a classic. I love that book, and Bob was a great writer. But that book came out before there was the Internet. So I had access to newspaper archives from all the little towns that Casey played in when he first came into professional baseball in 1910. 
and there was a treasure trove of things because he was always a character. He was always getting into mischief and stories just seemed to follow him along. Now, for those not that familiar with him, he had a career in baseball from 1910 to 1965. He died in 1975. Much of that career was as a pretty good outfielder, not a Hall of Fame outfielder, but a pretty good outfielder who hit 284, and then a very mediocre manager who managed uh, second division teams in the National League forever, it seemed. So it was a shock to everyone who followed baseball when the Yankees named him manager in 1949, this storied franchise with all their history and all their pennants. And they picked Casey Stengel, who some thought of as a baseball clown, to manage this team. The team still had Joe DiMaggio, the greatest player in the game at that time. And all Casey did to prove them wrong was win five world championships in his first five seasons. And he had his ticket to Cooperstown punched right there. Absolutely. Uh, to go back to your uh, old friend uh, Robert Kramer, I was telling someone off air before we started taping, uh, some 30 plus years ago I was producing a local uh, uh, sports talk show on radio. And in those days, as you said, there was no internet. My sources were the uh, brand new USA Today and the New York Post. That's where I got a lot of my guests because, again, it was a sports-themed program. And I was very fortunate to talk to a lot of, or at least talk to them off air to set up the appearance. And one of them was Robert Kramer and I was sent a copy of that book. So again, it was weird that when I saw you were writing this one, all of a sudden here it is, I'm, I'm flashbacking to 30 plus years ago, not only speaking with Robert, but then getting it so that he would appear on the program that I was, uh, I was doing or producing in those days. So uh, That's sm nice. small world, yeah, he's a nice I'm man. Pl I'm pleased that his sons uh, both thought he would have been really happy with that I did this book and would have been impressed that I carried on his work. So that meant a lot to me. Yeah. Um, it, to me anyway, and maybe, maybe again, there's just one man's opinion, the, the, the parallels between Casey and Joe Torre's managerial career, I think Casey's was much more mediocre, to say the least, than Joe. Joe was with the Mets and the Braves. Not a lot. And, not not a lot, but, but he was on some pretty bad, uh, Casey was on some pretty bad teams uh, as a manager and uh, but then of course he comes to the Yankees you know and then of course Joe explodes four championships in five years uh, right. and um, the other one too that I think gets uh, short changed also who is right up there is of course the legendary to us anyway Joe McCarthy uh, from the 30s and 40s who again you know won uh, what three or four in a row as well managing yes. before he left to go to uh, manage the Cubs and well, who else? He managed the Red Sox at one point? Yeah, the Cubs was before the Yankees. Oh, before, and yeah. And he didn't win right away. He won, I think, in his second season. Yeah. Uh, yeah, he, he didn't win in 31. He won in 32. Um, but he's a, he was a good prototype for that uh, situation also. Sure. Um, do you think that the five world champions, uh, championships, especially given how things were in those days. Basically, you had American National League first place versus first place. Now there's so many watered down divisions. Uh, do you find that, not to take away from Casey, do you find that Joe's accomplishment, Joe Torrey that is, was more difficult than Casey's or do you kind of still say Casey's is the, you know, the, uh, the, the stamp of approval that we want to strive for? Well, Casey did all he could in his time, but I think Torrey's accomplishments exceeded uh, Casey's. I think Torrey is the best manager in Yankee history um, because he won his world championships when you had to win three rounds in the postseason, not just one. He had players, millionaire players on multi-year contracts who weren't fighting for their jobs every year. He had multinational players who spoke all different languages that he had to communicate with. He had a very demanding boss that Casey Stengel didn't have. And he had all the second guessing going on with sports talk radio and everything like that, which Casey didn't have to deal with at all. So uh, Tory's accomplishments 
really exceed Casey's, yeah. um, which takes nothing away from Casey Stengel. It was just a different time. Marty Appel joining us for the hour here on Studio 411. The book Casey Stengel, Baseball's Greatest Character, uh, published by Doubleday. Uh, for more information on the book, uh, www.doubleday.com. Um, Again, as you mentioned, uh, I, I found it very interesting. Uh, if they took a vote, I'd love to know how close it was. Yogi, Yogi Bear actually finished second. I mean, I think of characters, you know, Yogi was, uh, again, uh, almost unto himself. So that's high praise that, you know, the two of them were really neck and neck. Cause again, it's nice it, that know. they were together for all those years. He was the only player that was there for the whole Casey Stengel run at, uh, at the Yankees, and then they reunited with the Mets. And um, when Yogi died a few years ago, as I point out near the end of the book, that marked the end of this long era of Stengelese and Yogiisms, yeah. which was so rich part of the American culture. And I saw in the book that uh, you spoke with Yogi, who again finished out his later years in a, uh, a facility. Again, I think I remember he had sold off his home and, and, and a lot of his prized possessions or whatever, and his health was starting to decline. Uh, but again, uh, the, uh, you spoke to him very, very uh, close to uh, the end of his life about uh, Casey for the book. I did, and he gave me some... I, I mean, I did not know that I was seeing him two weeks before he passed away, but that was the case. Um, it was a very lucid conversation. He was great with me. He, uh, he was talking about his old teammates and how uh, underappreciated some of their skills were. He talked about how fast a runner Hank Bauer was, whoever thought of that. Uh, and then he, I had one last yogiism. Maybe I was. it was his last. I don't know. But we were getting up to leave around 3 o'clock, 2.30, and a nurse came into the room. This was an assisted living facility. So the nurse came into the room, and Yogi turned to the nurse and said, what time is 3 o'clock mass? <laughs> I thought, beautiful. One last yogiism for me. <laughs> there you go. There you go. That sounds like a book title in the future, I'm telling you. Uh, <laughs> talk to me a little. Uh, and again, for those who don't know, Casey was born uh, in like 1890. As, as uh, Marty said, lived to 1975, which is hard to believe for me. I'm sure for Marty as well that that many years ago. Now, during your early years, I would say probably the answer would be no, because he didn't really come back to Yankee Stadium until uh, your buddy Bob Fischel uh, talked him into coming back in 70. I guess they were retiring his number. So in those four or five years, did you get to meet or spend any time with Casey at all? I did. I was uh, first Bob Fischel's assistant in the PR department, handling a lot of the logistics, including the travel and the hotel accommodations. And then Bob left in 1973. Old Timers Day was fully my responsibility. So for five years, I had reason to interact with Casey Stengel. And I'll tell you about that first Old Timers Day he came back to. He'd been estranged for 10 years from the Yankees because he was bitter over the way he was fired, or just he was bitter about being fired. Um, so he came back finally, the number was retired, he made a nice speech, and when he got home to Glendale, California, he wrote out an old-fashioned postcard, like a two-cent postage postcard. In those days, and in his yeah. big, scrawling handwriting, he wrote, Mrs. Stengel and I had a marvelous time, thanks to everyone, and thank you for my prize, Casey Stengel. The prize was uh, we gave every old timer a gift, like a little clock radio or something. It was worth about $75. It was really a gift, that's the word, <laughs> but he called it a prize. And I thought that made it like Cracker Jack. I thought that was terrific. <laughs> there you go. Well, again, uh, uh, something that's lost on 
today's culture where people, not, not as many as back in when we were kids, you know, write thank you notes or whatever. I mean, you know, maybe they'll send you a text. That's about, that's about as good. And they'll, they'll superimpose their signature on it. That's about it. Uh, Casey, again, uh, born in Kansas City, Missouri, as we said, uh, German-Irish heritage. Um, again, uh, you, um, you write in the book uh, that uh, Casey was a grinder who made the most of uh, the talent that he had. I was surprised, 284 hitter, not bad. Not bad. If they had all-star games back then, he probably would have been an all-star three or four times. As I said, he wasn't destined for the Hall of Fame, but he was a pretty decent ball player. And it was entirely in the National League. It got traded several times. He had his most success with the Brooklyn Dodgers, or the Robins, as they were called back then, and with the New York Giants, where John McGraw was his manager and kind of a mentor to him. Yeah, that I didn't know. Again, that's the, the, the beauty of this book is I think so many, so many of us knew Casey from those Yankees, uh, or in my case, more the Mets days, and the commercials and the Stengelisms that uh, you, uh, re in reading this book, really uh, amazed at the little tidbits of information. And of course, you had access because a couple of occasions, uh, I guess you had access to an unpublished memoir that Edna, his wife, uh, wrote. You also had access uh, towards the end of the book, I saw, to an unpublished memoir that um, Frank Crisetti, who was a longtime player and long, long time third base coach for the Yankees. So you really had an advantage over Bob Kramer's book of 35 years ago or more in that you, know, you had access to things that no one would really know about. Well, the Edna Stengel manuscript, which was never published, was given to me by um, Casey's grand niece. It was actually on Edna's side of the family. Um, this was a terrific find, Larry, because uh, Casey was kind of a one-dimensional guy in terms of most people who knew him. Unlike other ball players, he didn't hunt, he didn't fish, he didn't go to the movies, he didn't play cards. He had like no hobbies. He, he was in all in during baseball season, and then in the off season, he'd just sit back and read the sporting news and keep up to date on everything. So he was without hobbies, and nobody really knew there were other sides to him. The Edna Stengel manuscript reveals some of that. Casey, the suitor, the courtship, the marriage, their life together. And also, in 1937, during the height of the Depression, he got lucky enough to be included in a group that struck oil in Texas. The oil industry was just emerging. People were just discovering oils and oil wells. And uh, he was in this group, and it made him a wealthy man far beyond his baseball income. And that oil well still produces annual checks for the Stengel estate to this day. Amazing, amazing. It is like the Jed Clampett of baseball. Huh? That's yeah. right. <laughs> now, in the book, uh, uh, I read Casey did not graduate high school. Did he ever go back, or I'm sure he got maybe an honorary degree? No, nothing of that? He, uh, he quit with one month, to, with one semester to go because he had a chance to sign a professional contract and go play baseball. And uh, he, since he had no intention of going to college anyway, he didn't think that was a big deal, and off he went to play pro baseball. He did have enough credits, however, to enroll in uh, Western Dental College in Kansas City. So this is a funny story, but he was studying to be a dentist, and he went during three off-seasons to dental school. Uh, after the third semester or the third off season, he and his professors decided this was not the profession for him because he was left-handed and they didn't make left-handed dental equipment in those days. So I'm, I couldn't help it but write in the book, why did it take three semesters to come to this conclusion? <laughs> they should have known this the day he interviewed to enroll in the school. 
I guess they like that uh, tuition payments he was making. Yes, uh, <laughs> those, those things haven't changed in all these years. <laughs> so, as long as the money's there, we'll take you, I, I think is the right way. Another thing, too, and I, and I can relate to this because, again, coming from a, uh, uh, an old school family myself, again, uh, in my 30s, when I played in like a, a kind of a fast pitch hardball league, I came to realize, wow, I can actually hit left-handed or actually became a switch hitter. Why? Because uh, like other people in my family that, you know, in later years, they were allowed to write left-handed. Oh, that was like, you know, that was like uh, like a curse of the zombie. And I see in Casey's case, he did everything left-handed, but as a kid like I was, was told, no, you will write right-handed. So I and could he really. He signed his autographs right handed. Yeah, I could relate to that, and I thought, you know, again, that was just a thing where, oh, you know, you, there was something wrong with you if you were, you know, doing that left-handed. So yeah, I, mm -hmm. I, I could really appreciate, you know, what what he had to go through. Um, he had a neighbor when he was in Kansas City. Again, guy that I even had to look up. I knew the name. I didn't realize. You know quite the uh, how important a figure he was in the early days of baseball. A guy named Charlie Nichols, a Hall of Famer that uh, some of you baseball purists may know as Kid Nichols, who uh, won 361 games. He too became an early mentor to Casey. Yes, um, remarkable the way uh, you know that happened, and that Kid Nichols, one of the premier pitchers of the 19th century sort of took Casey under his wing and gave him some advice, told him, take advice, listen to people. You may discard the advice at some point, but let it roll around a little bit before you chuck it out. So that was good advice. And the fact that Casey Stengel, who lived to 1975, connected to Kid Nichols, who was pitching in the 1880s. is a terrific uh, little note there. And then, and then in some ways, although he didn't manage him, uh, then connects all the way to Tom Seaver and, and you yeah. know, people of that ilk, you know, because uh, after he, he retired uh, because of an injury that he suffered, he still, which I didn't know, retained a, a vice president's role with the club for a time and still an ambassador. I mean, um, not to jump ahead, but I know with Casey, I mean, with the Mets, did they really bring him in? I mean, here's a 72-year-old man in 1962. Was it really, oh, this guy is going to, like, you know, win for us? Or was it they just saw that the PR value of having him there was going to uh, was going to pay dividends beyond any wins that they could put up in the uh, in the win column. Well, that's exactly right, and I didn't fully appreciate it. Although I certainly remembered those years with the Mets, but I didn't fully appreciate it until I until I started talking to the guys who played for Casey with the Mets, Roger Craig and people like that, and it became clear that Casey was hired for PR and was not really managing the team. In 1960, his last year at the Yankees, he was fully engaged. I mean, he ran everything. Nothing happened without Casey signaling it off. By 62, after a year out of the game, his, uh, his engagement in the game itself was a little distant, and he'd yeah. frequently nod off in the dugout. But it was fascinating to learn that his coaches, Cookie Lavagetto and Solly Hemus, made the pitching rotation, did the lineup, really did the managing functions. And especially interesting that his center fielder, the great Richie Ashburn, who was in his final season, was running the game on the field, positioning the players and sort of the on-field manager while the game was going on. That was a terrific discovery, and all the players on the team told me that. Yeah. The other thing, too, that I didn't know was that uh, Gene uh, Autry, I almost said Gene Mock, but Gene Autry, the uh, famous cowboy singer that you always hear at Christmas time do all his, his Christmas favorites, that when they came into the league with the L.A. Angels, California Angels, whatever, uh, in 61, that he actually wanted Casey to manage his team, which I had never heard of. Yeah, Casey lived in California in the offseason. He lived in Glendale, which is part of the Los Angeles market. And uh, here was Autry starting this new team in Los Angeles. And he immediately thought, Casey's the guy for me. Largely for the same reasons. We great PR. 
in this media heavy city great theatrical Casey Stengel coming in uh, but Casey turned it down he wanted the year off he was working on an autobiography that year for which he got a lot of money so he didn't take that Horace Stoneham up in San Francisco offered him a job to manage the Giants in 62 uh, when Alvin Dark eventually got the job and Casey just sat out the year and George Weiss, who had moved from the Yankees to the Mets as their president, called him and kind of pleaded with him to come east. We need you, Casey. We need to compete with the Yankees. We need to get attention. This isn't going to be a very good ball club. We need to deflect attention away from the way the team's playing and onto uh, Casey's personality. And that's exactly what happened. It's really never been duplicated since uh, that exact formula. You mentioned Alvin Dark. We actually have a photograph of uh, Casey with the Mets. Alvin Dark. Uh, so I'm going to say it was probably 62, 63. Alvin was uh, managing the San Francisco Giants. And uh, that, that's a great shot. At first, I wasn't even sure who it was because I knew Alvin like both as a player and then later when he was with Cleveland as a manager. And I had forgotten that he was the manager of the uh, San Francisco Giants. Well, uh, he was the manager when they went in the World Series in 62. That's right. That's right. The famous. Uh, last out, the sizzler by Willie McCovey that Bobby Richardson practically didn't have to move. You know, and that was funny. I always thought of that. I mean, they, they lost the series in 60. Casey got, you know, fired, which that I was going to ask you before I make my point. Do you think that Casey was going to be shown the door regardless of the outcome? Yeah, that was the conclusion I reached. Win or lose, they uh, they knew he was getting on in years, that he was only at the most going to go another year or two. And in the process, they did not want to lose Ralph Houck, who had been their AAA manager and then their first base coach. And everybody in the organization just thought the world of Ralph Houck, that he was going to be he was the manager in waiting and they didn't want to lose him and as it happened both detroit and boston did make ralph Houck offers so when they got wind of that uh they knew we have to move now or we're going to lose Houck. and you know to their credit Houck won pennants in 61 62 63. yeah and then later on, a dozen years later, after he came back from being the GM and he was on some average, uh, you know, Not I was always successful. Uh, no, but I mean, the 68 club, I mean, to show you how excited we were getting, in those days it was a 10 10 team league in the American League, and Yankees got up to about as high as fourth, and everybody was like, oh, the Yankees are going to do it. They're going to do it. But they had a good team, 70, they had a good 90 win team. But again, you know, these were not the glory days, you know, when as when Ralph took over back in 61, you know, and then it got well, shut. I joined, I joined the team in 68, so this actually is my 50th anniversary of being in and around the Yankee organization because I'm still close to them. So you can, and you those can were imagine, the teams that I walked into then. You can imagine as a kid, we were excited when all of a sudden the Yankees get Lindy McDaniel. Okay, nobody thought he was going to amount to anything, and he was with them for four or five years years. You remember when Rocky Colavito pitched the second game of a doubleheader that year, I mean, and then hit a home run in one of the games. I mean, it was just, it was phenomenal. I mean, these were like little nuggets that we were like grasping onto, trying to like, you know, hope that something was going to happen. But alas, it was another, what, eight or nine years before they had paid dirt. But uh, Marty Appel joining us for the hour here on Studio 411. Uh, the book, uh, Casey Stengel, Baseball's Greatest Character by uh, Doubleday. For more information, www.doubleday.com. And before we get back to Marty, we're going to take a look at a clip since we've been talking about the Mets and the Yankees. But a uh, great clip from uh, uh, Universal uh, Features back in the day when they used to show these things uh, of the uh, Shea Stadium opening. Uh, April 20th, I believe, 1964, and uh, there's a little Casey in there doing some conducting of his own. Let's take a look. The curtain goes up on a new attraction in New York, Shea Stadium, new home of Casey Stengel's New York Mets. There's a massive traffic jam as 50,000 fans flock to the season's opener. But all of the irritations and frustrations are forgotten in the plush splendor of the new park. No need to walk. 21 escalators whisk you to all levels.
scoreboard can play back outstanding fielding and batting plays immediately. But everyone agreed that no one would want a playback of Casey leading Guy Lombardo's orchestra. This was one of the few sour notes heard all day. Historians were quick to note that on opening day, the last place Mets drew 50,000 fans, while the New York Yankees, perennial winners, drew only 12,000 on their opener the day before. We don't like to mention it, of course, but the Mets lost their first game in the new stadium when Pittsburgh downed them 4-3. to three. But just wait till tomorrow, or the next day, or the next. And we're back with Marty Appel, uh, again, uh, talking Casey Stengel, talking baseball. Um, I love that we have a shot of uh, Casey back in the day after he uh, played a little minor league ball. He got called up in uh, September 1912 uh, with the Brooklyn Dodgers. I believe we have a shot of him where he's wearing sunglasses. He's like one of the first players I can remember back in the dead ball era to wear, uh, wear sunglasses. And he probably just did it because it looked cool and it was unorthodox and uh, not ready to be accepted yet. And that was Casey. He was always ready for a dare or for something new. There you go. He's uh, unique. Uh, in, in some ways, you know, again, he, uh, I can see why he was chosen over Yogi. I mean, his, his you know, Stengalese extended over so many decades, as we talked before. I mean, he even knew people like Christy Mathewson and, you know, oh, Ty yeah. Cobb. When, when I saw Kid Nichols, I'm like, my God. And then you bring up the point how we're talking almost 80 years of pitching, you know, from, from one Hall of Famer all the way to the other. Amazing. Um, the other thing I didn't know was back in the day, Sunday baseball was not allowed in New York. I mean, what did we do on Sundays? There was no TV. There was, well, like, the assumption was everybody went to church. Ah, and that's why yeah. there were no baseball games those days. They didn't want to interfere with church. There you go. Turned out not everybody did it. <laughs> I, I guess, but I guess they must have stayed in church all day because, I mean, on a nice sunny Sunday, they must have been having picnics, I hope. Something. Well, the but, politicians, yeah. it was a good argument back then, but the politicians would point out out that the wealthy people would go to church and then go and play golf. Really? But the average working class person, even if they went to church, didn't have the option to go to a baseball game in the afternoon. So finally, finally, that law came down. Uh, some of his nicknames, again, the old professor, again, you know, these <laughs> just, uh, you know, even in Casey, his, his name, birth name was Charles Dylan Stengel. So, again, uh, remind us, uh, where did the, uh, the name Casey come about? Well, when I tell you, it'll be so obvious, but he was from Kansas City, KC. So uh, probably in his rookie season or something, one of his teammates would have shouted across the clubhouse, where are you from, Rook? And Charles Dylan Stengel would have said, KC, and there it was. And he was also at one point early on called Dutch. Again, uh, what was the, uh, the significance? Where did that come from? Well, he was German and Irish, but somehow Dutch was, <laughs> was used for German people, and I can't say I know why, but uh, that's where that came from. Yeah. Uh, Casey, uh, during his playing day, spent a little, very uh, brief cup of coffee with the Philadelphia Phillies. And, of course, uh, as, as we discussed, played with the Dodgers, later managed the Dodgers. We have a great photo of uh, Casey that was kind of mocked up where it shows Casey basically in four different scenarios. One is a player manager with, the, with Brooklyn. Uh, played with the uh, Boston Braves, or known as the Bees in those days. Uh, the Yankees, and I'm forgetting, oh, the Brooklyn Dodgers, or what was that nickname the, uh, that they had? Uh, the Robins. No, the one before that, the, something to do with the word superb. Oh, Superbas. Superbas, uh, yeah. Like, it didn't have to do with being in the suburbs or anything. It was just being a superb baseball team, so they were the Superbas. And far, fr nickname, far right? from it from what I read. <laughs> they, far from it. They, they weren't very good, weren't very good at all. Um, but they were in the World, one World Series when Casey was there yeah. in 1916 when they played Boston uh, when Babe Ruth was a pitcher. There you go. And, of course, then in the 20s, when you said earlier he linked up with uh, the gentleman who uh, became his mentor, a uh, Hall of Famer uh, manager, John McGraw, with the old New York Giants, uh, Casey uh, won a couple of uh, World Series. As a matter of fact, uh, was a star of one uh, one that I remember. Even Didn't he have one, too, where even in a losing cause he, he was the star of both victories? 
23, which was the Yankees' first world championship and the first year of Yankee Stadium, and in that World Series, Casey won two games with home runs, uh, including an inside-the-park home run, uh, which was the first World Series home run ever hit in Yankee Stadium. He slid home. He thought he lost a shoe running the bases. And he said to the on-deck hitter who was standing there, I think I lost a shoe. And the on-deck hitter said, well, how many were you wearing? Because <laughs> he still had two on. Oh, well. <laughs> now, I got the impression that was Casey just right person at the right time, not necessarily managing, because obviously he went a long time where you know he was considered a buffoon, to be perfectly frank. But um, in terms of just not just the oil thing, but I mean, he seemed like that he always seemed to fall into the soup, but in a positive way. You know, he, he always seemed to be coming into money somehow. I mean, he, 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 well, they did lose all their money in the 1929 stock market mm -hmm. crash. Correct, yeah. So we had a rebuild from there. Uh, but Edna was pretty smart financially, and obviously they wound up very well off and, you know, did fine for themselves financially. But uh, many times before his Yankee days, uh, life was not so smooth and easy. He wasn't always sure where the next job was coming from. He got fired a lot. He got released as a player a lot. So uh, you mentioned before about um, playing with Brooklyn. When he, The first time he went back to Brooklyn as a player, uh, he was with Pittsburgh. And uh, hard to imagine this today, but now he's... Oh, and Marty mentioned Pittsburgh, and he got frozen on it. So uh, Marty Appel joining us for the hour here on Studio 411. 1937 and 1961 were really the two years that Casey was not managing, not doing anything in terms of his first love baseball. I think it was probably easier in 61. But again, imagine from 1912 to 1975, uh, basically being involved with something that you just love to get up in the morning. I mean, that's, that's pretty impressive. Uh, it's true. And by the time his, he was in his later years, he lived to be 85 years old. People would just visit him when they were in California to pay homage to him, to be in his presence. He was such a beloved figure. He was baseball royalty. And the fact that he had so many stories and was such a good storyteller and could tell you Babe Ruth and Ty Cobb and Christy Mathewson stories was a remarkable thing, especially for each generation of sports writers that would come along and newly discover him. Um, another one, too, that, that amazed me just in terms of the longevity. He, uh, he managed in the early 40s a young player named Warren Spahn, Hall of Fame pitcher, again at the beginning of his career. And then in 1965, for a brief time, the Mets acquires Spahn from the Braves near the end of his career. And I, I, there was a line somewhere, I guess, about how, you know, when Casey was with Spahn at the beginning and the end, he was great in between, but on those two ends, he wasn't so great. So Warren Spahn said, <laughs> uh, he said, Casey managed me before and after he was a genius. There you go. <laughs> that was the line. <laughs> <laughs> oh, my goodness. And we, we've got a shot of, uh, actually, why don't we show the, uh, the Hall of Fame plaque? Because, again, uh, for those who haven't had a chance to go up to uh, Cooperstown, New York, Again, you know, quite an impressive. As a matter of fact, I'm surprised they didn't need like two plaques to put all the information that uh, you had on Casey. And actually, you helped me out on this one. Is he wearing a Yankee hat, or uh, I assume he's wearing a Yankee hat? He wouldn't be wearing a Boston Braves. That wouldn't. That wouldn't have he's looked. He's wearing too good. a Yankee hat, but the fact that he managed the Mets, of course, is on the plaque, and that was the first time the Mets ever had a mention on a Hall of Fame plaque. And so that was a nice little very early trivia on. thing. And then when he used to come, I don't know if he did it the year that you had him in 70 at, at Yankee Stadium, but I know in those later years before he passed, he used to come out onto the field and he had a hat with four, with the Dodgers, what, the Giants, the Mets, and the Yankees. I always thought that that, that should have been. There was more. There was more. Because it was also the Phillies and the Pirates who he played for as well, and the Braves who he managed. 
and he also managed Brooklyn, but that was also, he was a player there too. But it was the logos of all the teams that he'd had a relationship with. Oh, I thought it was just the four New York-based teams. I gotcha, I gotcha. Uh, Casey uh, goes back to, was it Washington Park was with the uh, the early Yankees, known as the Highland uh, Highlanders? No, 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 that was the where the Dodgers played before Ebbets Field. Oh, okay. So he was in the last game ever played in Washington Park, which is a site in Brooklyn that is now a Con Edison facility, but there's an outfield wall, a brick wall that still exists. So if you're really a student of baseball history, you can touch the wall and you're touching the early days of the Brooklyn Dodgers. Wow. But he goes from there to Yankee Stadium and it's all, it's, uh, you know, renovations, et cetera, et cetera, to the Polo Grounds, to Ebbets Field, to uh, back to the Polo Grounds because the Mets played there the first two years, and then to Shea Stadium. Unfortunately, the streak breaks when I guess they built the new Yankee Stadium, but his spirit is probably roaming around there somewhere. Well, he is consider he is the only uh, person to have worn the uniforms of all four New York teams, the Dodgers, the Giants, the Yankees, and the Mets. But as I sometimes like to point out, uh, he's the only person to this point, because I'm still hopeful that the Dodgers and the Giants will realize the error of their ways and return back to New York, and so others will have the chance to do that. Uh, I'm not sure that's going to happen, but uh, hope springs eternal. There you go. And now Casey, of course, during all those years, when he would get fired from one team, he would go to another in a couple of cases. And he actually went back to the minor leagues. He took over for Charlie Grimm with the then minor league Milwaukee Brewers for a year. Right. Uh, then uh, George Weiss, who was the uh, head honcho with later with the Yankees and the Mets, uh, brought him to manage the uh, Kansas City Blues. But the one that really elevated Casey was his time with the uh, the Oakland uh, Oaks back uh, back in the late 40s that that's really what made Casey uh, the manager I think that he became with the Yankees yeah that was the Pacific Coast League and we on the East Coast don't have a full appreciation of the strength and power of that league but you know back then there were 16 teams and today there are 30 so you could make the argument that the 14 best minor league teams in those days would have been major league teams by today's standards. Um, Casey managed the Oakland Oaks to the 1948 Pacific Coast League Championship. He had a young infielder on that team named Billy Martin, and he would bring Billy with him to New York a couple of years later. And Billy came to be known as Casey's boy because Casey kind of tutored him and mentored him. But eventually didn't put up a fuss when Billy got traded uh, in 1957 after a famous Yankee brawl at the Copacabana nightclub. You know, and on a, on a sad note, uh, the I was very surprised to read that when Casey passed, that really with all these people in terms of players, et cetera, et cetera, that in 75 when he passed, uh, Billy Martin really was one of the few ball players or ex-players that went to Casey's funeral. It's true. Uh, not only that, for however we would describe it, but... Um, Billy slept in Casey's bed that night at his home in Glendale. So that was kind of Casey would call that amazing. That was one of his favorite words. One of the quotes from the book, a longtime Yankee player and then a later coach for many years than when I was following the Yankees, uh, Frank Rossetti, the crow as they call him, stated that Casey was a very good teacher. So again, that was certainly high praise from a gentleman who spent quite a bit of years in, in the game as well. He would, he had this special drill in spring training. He would take his whole roster, base by base by base, on like the first few days of spring training. And he'd everybody standing around first base, and he had, here are all the things that can happen if you're a fielder or if you're a runner and you're at first base. And he'd go through all these little things that a lot of the guys had never even thought about. And he'd repeat it at second and at third and on the pitcher's mound. He was a good teacher. He loved passing on his knowledge of the game. And whereas the public thought he double-talked with his Stengalese, the players
players always said, no, we, we knew what Casey was saying all the time. Casey, like I said, it, it's uh, it's such an amazing book in that you can go at this uh, discussion from so many different angles. Uh, frankly, I'm more fascinated by the, the non-Yankee stuff because that's been played up for so many years. Uh, the Mets stuff was always interesting. I had read many books by folks that you knew back in the day. Uh, there was a great book in the early 70s on the New York Mets that covered that. Uh, uh, and I'm blanking on the gentleman's name. It was Leonard some Thing or other, but it was a phenomenal uh, book that uh, you know covered the team and just my friend Leonard Coppett. There, there you go. Thank you for bailing me out there. Yeah, it was uh, marvelous. And uh, Maury Allen, another gentleman from back in those days, many years ago when I was uh, was uh, lining up some of these people to be on. He was a marvelous guest as well. And and uh, again, a guy that was always a pleasure to read in the papers. And you know, these people uh, again, the Casey's boys, Dick Young, who again he he. Didn't get along with a lot of people, but apparently he was good buddies with Casey. In those days, Dick Young liked the association with the rank and file, with the players and the manager. Later on, he became close to the owners and to management. But he and Casey got along very well. And Dick Young was a hardworking journalist, always with his notepad open, walking around, taking notes. Uh, Casey liked to call the writers who covered his teams my writers and it was a way of ingratiating them with him and they kind of looked after Casey they made sure that he got good press all the time Casey was a genius at that now in 65 it was later than I thought it was late July of 65 had Casey not uh, fractured his hip uh, which may have been due to some uh, excessive drinking, but again, those are only rumors. Um, what, in your opinion, would have happened? Would he have continued to manage these lovable losers, or what was the feeling you got? Were they thinking, you know, we've got to start to make a change here because now you have the new stadium, Shea Stadium, and now, you know, you got to eventually start putting a winning product on the field. So It's true, and the fans were starting to get a little impatient, too. Uh, they weren't as lovable as the original 62 Mets. They were now kind of dull Mets, um, not really exciting anyone and not losing games in odd, funny ways. So the time was approaching that they had to get more serious, uh, which when Gil Hodges came to manage in 68 was indeed what happened. But there were those years with Wes Westrom between 65 and 68 when they were still not making much progress. I will give him props in that, uh, not to give Casey all the credit. Obviously, there were other people behind the scenes making decisions, but they did, when he left, at least have some players, <laughs> excuse me, like Ron Swoboda, uh, Cleon Jones, a few other people that were sprinkled in there who were starting to, you know, Bud Harrelson was on the rise, Tug McGraw, that were starting to try to crack through. But, of course, it wasn't until the pitching came later on under Westrom and then Gil Hodges that, you know, the Seavers, the Kuzmans, that really, you know, put together what became that uh, uh, 69 World Championship team. And, um, and there was a great video clip, I don't know if you ever saw it, Tony Kubek of NBC Sports, of course, a former shortstop with Casey with the Yankees, talking to Casey, and Casey just going on, and Kubek's looking at the camera lens almost like, you know, I don't know what to do, I can't quiet this guy, you know. It's, yeah, but, you know, he loved Casey, or at least that's the, the impression he gave the viewer. Well, Tony had played for Casey, of course, uh, with the Yankees and been in World Series with the Yankees. And most of, Bobby Richardson said he was a tough guy to play for. And Bobby was not a particularly big fan of Casey Stengel's. And a lot of players were not because Casey played what was known as platoon baseball, moving guys in and out depending on whether they batted right-handed or left-handed. So if you were playing that day, you liked Casey. If you weren't playing that day, you didn't like Casey quite as much. But at the end of the year, when they were cashing their World Series checks, it all, all was right with the world. That's right. And actually, uh, the platooning really uh, became, you know, the hallmark of baseball in later decades. I mean, now it's it's uh, nobody thinks twice about, you know, platooning somebody. Because it's all computer-generated now showing... <laughs> that Casey knew what he was doing. 
the decisions he was making and the lineups he was producing on a daily basis, today a computer would have generated that and would have justified Casey. I don't know, computer mind and Casey's mind, I'm not sure. I'm having trouble <laughs> reconciling the two, but I'll take your word for it. 1966, Casey's elected to the Baseball Hall of Fame. Uh, a great quote in the book here, um, a telegram from uh, President Lyndon Johnson, uh, quote, it is most fitting that Stengel should be enshrined in the Hall of Fame as he is already enshrined in the hearts of millions of his countrymen. So millions, I should say, so uh, high praise. I praise from uh, the uh, then President of the United States. As a former PR guy, I compliment whoever wrote that for President Johnson. <laughs> there you go. Oh, okay. Oh, you, they have writers? They, they can't come up with that stuff on the rook? Of course, I have to mention in our remaining literally minute here before we say goodbye to Marty. Marty is coming to us from the uh, uh, Appel box uh, at the uh, faux Yankee Stadium. So if you see that, you know, if you didn't see it the last time he was here, that was pretty, pretty impressive. Pretty impressive. And I see that light still on. Are you still peeping uh, through those windows out there? It's a Hilton Timeshare Hotel. Oh, it is? There. Okay. And believe me, you get tired of that view very fast. <laughs> <laughs> very good. Well, we certainly have not grown tired of uh, not only having you join us, but this book, as I said to uh, Marty off air, uh, probably to me is best work. Uh, a terrific book. Uh, I thoroughly enjoyed reading it. Uh, Casey Stengel, Baseball's Greatest Character, uh, Doubleday. Uh, www.doubleday.com for more information. Uh, Marty, we look forward to uh, your next work, and uh, again, we look forward to having you back with us uh, sooner than uh, the, la the last time. Way too long, Marty, way too long. Pleasure being on with you. Thanks for having me, Larry. Very good. You hang in there a second. We're going to end uh, the program. Uh, of course, how else could we? Marty and I can't compete with uh, Casey, Casey Stengel. We're going to see a clip of him addressing uh, Congress. A scary thought. But then again, uh, today's politics, he probably would fit in just very well. Uh, Casey Stengel's congressional testimony, video, audio from back in 1958. We thank you for joining us here on Studio 411. Enjoy, and we'll see you next time. Take care. There is now, uh, through the farm system, a major league control of the professional occupation of baseball playing. Is that a correct summary? Well, you have uh, that, uh, from the standpoint of what you've been reading, you've got that down very good. I said, just like I uh, made a talk not long ago, and I told them all when they was drinking and they invited me in, I said, you ought to be home. You men are not making enough money. You can't drink like that. They said, this is a holiday for the Shell Oil Company. And I said, why is it a holiday? They said, we did something great for three years, and we are given two days off for the to watch the Yankees play the White Sox, but they were mostly White Sox rooters. I said, well, you're not doing right. I said, you can't take those drinks and all, even on your holidays. You ought to be home and raising more children because the big league clubs now give you 100000 for a bonus to go into baseball. <laughs> and by the way, I don't have to have any children, but I wish Mrs. Stengel and I had eight. I'd like to put them in on that bonus rule. <laughs>